It's Christmas time, which can only mean one thing. The Doctor Who Christmas Special! Oh yeah. I forgot. Chibnall cancelled that. Yeah, thanks mate. The Doctor Who Christmas special was a staple of British TV for over 10 years, and I still live in vain hope that it will be coming back to our screens at some point in the future. The best Doctor Who Christmas specials embrace the campiness of both the festive season and Doctor Who as a whole, providing us with an easy way to escape from the inevitable fatigue that occurs after you've just tucked into a mother load of food on Christmas Day. Across this video we'll be counting down the best Doctor Who Christmas specials since the show returned in 2005, and looking deeper into what exactly makes a good Christmas special. For the purposes of this video, we'll be excluding last year's New Year's special resolution. Chiefly because, well, it's not actually a Christmas special, is it? And if Chibnall can't be bothered, then neither can we. If you're really desperate to hear our thoughts on that episode, you can do so by watching our breakdown after it airs. So without further ado, it's time to definitively rank every single Doctor Who Christmas special. Let's start with number 13, The Doctor, The Widow and The Wardrobe. The Doctor, the Widow and the Wardrobe comfortably stands as the weakest Doctor Who Christmas special. Taking cues from Moffat's far superior first Christmas episode, A Christmas Carol, The Doctor, the Widow and the Wardrobe is a pastiche of The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, which lacks any of its source materials, charm or wit. Whilst Moffat wanted this episode to be the, quote, most Christmassy Christmas special ever. The story doesn't really have anything especially Christmassy in its content beyond masses of snow and the obvious date upon which it is set. Uh, Christmas Day. Instead, the episode is tonally confused, opting to juggle a serious story about grief with a silly adventure in which the Doctor must help retrieve a lost child from an enchanted forest before it is hit by acid rain. What? Whilst these kind of juxtapositions are a hallmark of the show, here it feels as if we're being fed two different stories simultaneously, and the episode fails to give us anything memorable to latch onto in terms of its villains or characters. Like, what is it supposed to be about? A meditation on the devastating effects of war? A call to arms against the looming environmental crisis? Or a light, fluffy Christmas story? It's really confused. This episode marks the beginning of the flanderization of the 11th Doctor, with Smith's constant spinning and goofy looks bordering on unwatchable. The episode also utilises the well-worn Moffat trope of ensuring that no character who seemingly dies is able to do so without some kind of miraculous resurrection. Whilst this idea felt fresh when the series rebooted in 2005, by this point in the series history we've seen characters manage to escape certain deaths so many times that when Reg's plane makes it through the time vortex it's eye-rollingly cliched. The only bit I like at all is the opening scene which plays up to the length Doctor's stylings as a bit more of an action hero than his New Who predecessors. That is some sweet role, boy. Overall, there isn't really a legitimate reason to revisit the story beyond being a completionist, and the Doctor, the Widow and the Wardrobe certainly stands as one of the 11th Doctor's most uninspired outings. At number 12, Last Christmas. Last Christmas is a really odd story in the show's history, because it decides to omit the Doctor and his companions entirely in favour of Amelia Clarke and Henry Golding, who embark on a romantic comedy of sorts set to the music of the late great George Michael. I can't really work out what the point of this special was, and it didn't even air on Christmas Day or on television, instead being released as a feature film. If you're sat there listening to this wondering why I'm delaying the inevitable discussion around this Christmas special with a painfully unfunny and drawn out bit, just know that it's because the real special is worse. It's so much worse. Last Christmas was the first Peter Capaldi Christmas special, and whilst it's not devoid of captivating ideas in the same manner as our previous entry, it does have the same tonal inconsistencies which plague some of the worst Christmas specials of the revived era. I do think that Dream Crabs, a mashup of the facehuggers from Alien, and the dream within a dream surrealism of Inception, are an interesting idea and the script does well to navigate its inherently complex story structure without ever feeling convoluted. However, where this special falls flat on its face is its attempts to give an epilogue to Clara and Danny Pink's relationship, something which was dealt with excellently in the Series 8 finale, Death in Heaven. Whilst Clara's lies regarding Danny's death and her obvious grief could have led to an interesting arc across the show's ninth series, the decision to bring Danny back to allow Clara to swiftly move on feels like a massive misfire and undoes a lot of the groundwork done to add layers to Clara's character across the previous series. 
Moreover, the fake-out of an aged Clara was the result of uncertainty regarding Coleman's continuation of the series, I get that, but it feels like a last-minute decision in the worst possible way. Rendering the Doctor's emotional goodbye as yet another dream sequence in an episode which is full of them makes the scene feel redundant and the series has handled fake companion departures, such as Rory's in Cold Blood, in a much more nuanced fashion. Although I will say that if there's ever a time to pull that kind of stunt, I'll be far more likely to let them off at Christmas. Add in a weird parallel plot which concerns the 12th Doctor meeting Father Christmas, and you have a story which, like the previous entry, fails to balance its more serious material with its simultaneous need to provide a light-hearted story for the whole family to enjoy on Christmas Day. Number 11. Twice Upon a Time. In what will go down in history as perhaps the strangest multi-doctor story of all time, twice upon a time sees the 12th Doctor, unwilling to regenerate after the events of the Doctor Falls, encountering his first incarnation also on the cusp of regeneration. That's nice, that's neat. The catch? This version of the Doctor is a little politically incorrect. Older gentlemen, like women, can be put to use. You can't, you can't, you, you can't say things like that. Can't I? Whilst the first Doctor's mannerisms are accurately rendered by David Bradley, who previously also played the character in the excellent adventure in Space and Time, it can't help but feel like the whole thing is a bit of an insult to the show's early days, particularly given the fact that for so many viewers, especially children, this may be their very first encounter with the character. More importantly, the first Doctor also detracts from the fact that this is Peter Capaldi's last story, which means that the 12th Doctor, easily one of the best incarnations of the character, gets a rather limp send-off, which isn't really fitting of his legacy. This episode also copies many beats from Moffat's previous regeneration story, Time of the Doctor, with the Doctor being visited by his former companions, feeling like a complete rehash of something we've seen before. Raggedy man. All my memories. We have to give this episode extra points, however, because it was born out of Moffat's love for the show's Christmas specials, wanting to ensure that they remained a staple of the show in the tricky transition between showrunners. And you can tell that this adventure is an epilogue to the excellent series 10 finale The Doctor Falls, rather than a full-blown story in its own right. This context makes us feel a bit put out after the whole affair because only a year later, Chris Chibnall, Chris Chibnall, would decide to scrap Christmas specials altogether, meaning that Moffat's decision to preserve tradition over giving the 12th Doctor a fitting send-off can't help but leave a bitter taste in our mouths. In at number 10, The Next Doctor. The Next Doctor is probably one of the most forgettable episodes in the show's history. It's not necessarily bad per se, just thoroughly mediocre, relentlessly average, with a plot that feels as if it's deliberately slight coming off the back of arguably the most ambitious finale in the show's history. If The Stolen Earth and Journey's End is the Infinity War and Endgame of the Hooniverse, epic genre-bending episodes packed with a giant roster of characters and requiring an in-depth knowledge of all that has come before it, then The Next Doctor is similar to Spider-Man Far From Home, offering us a serviceable plot and a few good moments in an otherwise forgettable entry in the franchise. It was already known at this point that Tennant was intending to leave the series, so the decision to do an episode featuring a future incarnation of the character and then have this be a fake out is genius, I'll give them that. That they chose to give this role to David Morrissey, an actor who had been long rumoured as a potential candidate for the Doctor, only adds greater weight to the episode's accomplishments and all the stuff featuring his character, Jackson Lake, is great. But on the flip side, everything with the Cybermen, oh, oh boy, does it suck some major ass. The problem arises with the fact that the main plot doesn't really do much with this setup. Offering us a generic Cyberman story with a Victorian era skin, which basically just recycles stuff you've seen on Doctor Who a thousand times before. There's a missing person search which leads the Doctor to uncover a conspiracy theory and... Who cares? There's a cold-hearted villain who strikes a deal with a familiar villain, only to be double-crossed later down the line and converted into said villain before promptly trying to attack everyone on sight. Oh, and of course, the story features a quick-fire resolution, with everything just sort of being pulled into a vortex by the Doctor. This story really isn't that bad, and as mindless entertainment to enjoy as your full of roast dinner, it does an okay job. Just don't expect to have your mind blown. Number 9. Time of the Doctor. Time of the Doctor is quite possibly the most bonkers regeneration story in the show's history. Cramming so many references, monsters and story resolutions into its 60 minute runtime that it can't help but feel anything other than overstuffed. But maybe 
maybe that's the point. After facing mounting criticism over his complicated plot lines and seemingly unresolvable series arcs, Moffat needed a hard reset going into the Capaldi era, and whilst the story ultimately does crumble under the weight of its own ambition, Time of the Doctor does at least attempt to bring the 11th Doctor's era to a close in a story which is elevated substantially by Matt Smith's performance. He's really trying here, even if the material is beyond lacking. It feels like another casualty in 2013's Who Output, as Moffat has since admitted that the 50th anniversary special was a nightmare to produce and clearly affected the quality of Series 7B in the process. The best regeneration stories give us a chance to go on one last adventure with a given incarnation of the Doctor, but Time of the Doctor takes far too long to get us to this point, derailing any time we have with Smith by introducing us to these pointless one-time characters like Handles and Tasha Lem, or wasting time with fan-pleasing guest appearances that just go nowhere, like this Weeping Angel attack is so unnecessary. What is it? There is a Weeping Angel under the snow. Where this episode does score points is in some of the more understated moments, such as the conversation between Eleven and Clara in which he tells her that he is, after a very long and tiring battle, close to death. But you don't die. You change. You pop right back up with a new face. No, not forever. I don't care what anyone says. The sidestepping of the regeneration limit was something that needed to happen eventually with the Time Lord simply giving the Doctor a new set of regenerations rather than getting bogged down in some hardcore discussion about lore which would ultimately detract from all the other stuff that the story has to get done. It might be an obvious and meddlesome retcon to make the 11th Doctor the final Doctor in the cycle, but to Moffat's credit, he didn't have much room to write his way out of this one. Overall, Time of the Doctor is packed full of fantastic ideas, but fails to merge them together into a satisfying whole, and it often feels as if you're watching a montage of Eleven's tenure rather than a coherent story in its own right. Number 8. The Return of Doctor Mysterio I have to admit, I was so, so sure the return of Doctor Mysterio was going to suck. Who was neglected that year with a series hiatus, pushing the would-be 2016 series to 2017, meaning that this was the only bit of Who love we were due to get? And yes, I am ignoring class, because, well, well, it was utter wasn't it? Resisting the urge to ape the hugely popular superhero movies that have dominated the current era of cinema, Moffat instead used Superman the movie as his template to concoct the narrative. This is a superhero story about the risks that come with leading a double life, and has less in common with snapped necks and a bizarre hatred for colour. Justin Chatwin is brilliant as Superman uh, the Ghost, as is his Lois Lane counterpart Lucy, played by Charity Wakefield. The whole thing really hinges on their chemistry, and the special successfully channels the charm that made audience is fall in love with the genre in 1978. Also, I do just really like that whilst the Doctor is surely present in the story, he's not really the hero. This is the ghost's story, and the Doctor just happens to be the wandering traveller who stops by to witness a piece of it. Oh, and bonus points for Nardole, overcoming all the odds and actually being massively entertaining. He's also one of the best parts of Series 10. Number 7. The End of Time. The End of Time is a story of two halves. On the one hand, you have a disorganised, unfocused first part, which spends the vast majority of its runtime struggling to scramble together a story, in favour of treating us to bizarre set pieces featuring a sort of zombified version of the Master. Cream and beer, and pork and beef and fat and great big chunks of hot and wet and red. Good for you, mate. Maybe we better be going. On the other, you have a tight and disciplined second half which, whilst at times crumbling under the weight of its own ambition, brings the Tenth Doctor's time in the TARDIS to a close in spectacular fashion. What really pulls this episode up in terms of overall quality are the central performances from David Tennant and Bernard Cribbins, whose chemistry is so good that it really makes you wish that Tennant had almost stayed for another year just so that we could get a full series with Will from the TARDIS. I'm going to die. Well, so am I one day. Don't you dare. Alright, I'll try not to. <laughs> Tennant and Cribbins have a natural rapport and it makes perfect sense that the Doctor would choose to spend his final adventure with Wilf because, as men who have both lived long and tiring lives, they are kindred spirits. The way Wilf idolises and upholds the Doctor's usually positive manner in the face of overwhelming odds and his own dark interior always brings a tear to my eye. The Time Lords returning, albeit momentarily, feels like a natural conclusion to the multi-series spanning arc that Davies set up all the way back in Series 1. But really, the only reason to watch this story is for the glorious fan-pleasing final 15 minutes, which beautifully showcases every aspect of the Tenth Doctor's personality. Here we see flickers of the Time Lord victorious. I could do so much more! Before he kindly resides himself to his fate. 
Wilfred. It's my honour. Knowing that he could never let an innocent man die simply because he doesn't wish to regenerate. The final trip the Doctor takes, checking in on all the companions we've met across the way, is a perfect send off to an era which rivals the Holmes Hinchcliffe days as the best run in the show's history, and who could forget Tennant's final words, which, unlike so many other regeneration stories, aren't a lengthy speech or monologue, but a simple declaration. I don't want to go. Beautiful. Number 6, The Runaway Bride. The Runaway Bride is an important story in Doctor Who history. For one, it's the second Christmas special and thus carries almost more of a burden than the Christmas Invasion by not only having to stand as a story in its own right, but also prove that Invasion wasn't a fluke, and that the Doctor and his friends would be a mainstay for Christmases to come. Secondly, and no less importantly, this is the first story in the revival not to feature Rose Tyler as a companion, and so acts as a litmus test for fans who had not yet seen the Doctor without Billy Piper by his side. On both counts, the episode is a resounding success, featuring a story which, whilst not quite to the high bar set by the Christmas Invasion, cements the formula that Davies established for the Doctor on their first festive outing. Moreover, the introduction of Catherine Tate as Donna, who would go on to travel with the Doctor in Series 4, is excellent, providing us with a complete contrast to Rose in the form of a character who is near hostile to the Doctor's whimsical tendencies. Donna. Human. Yeah. Is that optional? The design of the Rachnos is super inspired, and her manipulation of Donna's fiancé, Lance, provides a dark alternative to the promises of time and space that are often given out by the Doctor. It's like you said, Doctor, the big picture. What's the point of it all if the human race is nothing? This episode also features one of the most chilling moments in Tennant's tenure in the form of this. <laughs> as Tennant stands there, watching as the Rachnos and her children face certain death, we can't help but be reminded that for all his humanoid characteristics, the Doctor is very much an alien who is capable of enacting an almost divine form of justice upon those that are foolish enough to cross him. It's this balance between light and dark that so many of Doctor Who's Christmas specials struggle with, but when an episode can provide a scene like this, as well as set pieces involving a robotic Father Christmas, you know you're onto a winner. Number 5. The Snowman the Snowman was one of the hardest episodes to place on this list. On the one hand, the storylines that it tried to set up, the introduction of a new companion, Clara, and a new recurring threat for the Doctor in the form of the Great Intelligence, were either rebooted later down the line or brushed aside as one of Moffat's more regrettable attempts to resurrect a classic Who villain. On the other hand, the story is just so damn fun, introducing us to a new companion, new TARDIS, and regrettably a new costume, with a confidence that suggested that this phase for the Smith era was going to be a blast, even though it ultimately wasn't. It was actually the worst, wasn't it? It was the worst era, not just for Smith, but for all the new Who Doctors. It's just... It's just awful, isn't it? There's a lot to be said for the Victorian iteration of Clara in this episode, who, until the character was rebooted into her best iteration in Series 8, seemed to be leagues ahead of the underdeveloped version of the character we met in the following episode, The Bells of St. John. This Clara is resourceful, witty, fun, and bounces off the 11th Doctor with ease, and she even gets treated to one of the more iconic TARDIS entrances of the revived series. Smaller on the outside. Okay. That is a first. The story features the best utilisation of the Paternoster Gang, a team which I've always had slightly mixed feelings about, but here they offer a neat contrast to the 11th Doctor's Scrooge-like retreat to his TARDIS in the clouds, and ensuring that the story doesn't get too bogged down in nihilism. Where is it? Where's what, sir? I sent you to get the memory worm. Did you? The Snowmen and the Ice Governess are probably the scariest villains of any Doctor Who Christmas special, with the climactic action scene inside the Latimer house as intense as many of the best Doctor Who action sequences. If we disregard everything that followed and take the Snowmen on its own terms, then it's an excellent start to this new era for the 11th Doctor, setting up a strong central mystery which would reverberate across the remainder of the show's seventh series. But of course the fact that Series 7B did disappoint means it takes a lot of the shine off of this special. Number 4. The Husbands of River Song. You taught me to Derillium, to see the singing towers. 
When we first met Professor River Song all the way back in 2008, alongside Tennant's 10th Doctor, we all wondered when we might get to witness the final time that they would meet in his time stream, the Singing Towers of Derillium. It felt like, for better or worse, their relationship was always building towards that. Cut to 2013's limp series finale, Name of the Doctor, and it seemed like we would never get to see that come to pass. The episode felt like the final time we would ever see River Song. For many years, it felt like the closure on that relationship would never come come to pass. So how exciting was it when it was announced in 2015 that the Christmas special that year would see the 12th Doctor coming face to face with his dead, she's not dead, wife River. In a story that features hilarious hijinks, perfect for a Christmas special, and strong emotional highs, essential for any good Doctor Who story, I find it hard not to enjoy the Husbands of River song for both the excellent one-off special and near decade-long resolution that it is. Greg Davies' King Hydroflax is an utter dickhead in all the best ways, it's got some great concepts like the ship run entirely by and for criminals, and at the heart of it is a humorous buddy adventure between the Doctor and River. Her tenure on the show was a mixed bag, no doubt, but I think this special actually nailed what was intriguing about the character in the first place, and River's unexpected chemistry with the typically more chaste 12th Doctor was a refreshing treat. The idea that she doesn't recognise him at first makes for some fun moments. Finally. Finally. It's my go. But transforms into a satisfying payoff. Hello, sweetie. When all the pieces start to fall into place, I can't help but feel immensely satisfied knowing where it's all leading to. You know what? They should build a restaurant right here with a view of those towers. Usually when, well, any show builds up an event as a huge life-changing moment of lore for characters to repeatedly refer to, it's only ever disappointing to see it finally unfold. But for me, I think this story hits all the notes that it needed to, and it's a worthy depiction of that heartfelt speech River gave to the Tenth Doctor all those series ago. I never imagined anyone other than Matt Smith taking River Song to the Singing Towers, but when I saw Capaldi step out to greet her in that fresh new suit, it just felt right. And what better time is there to give these two their final happily ever after than at Christmas? Number 3. The Christmas Invasion Here we are. The episode that started it all. Honestly, it's so strange to think that before the Sycorax burst onto our screens in 2005, the only other Christmas special that existed in Doctor Who history was this strange fourth wall break from William Hartnell from the Daleks' master plan. Incidentally, a happy Christmas to all of you at home! The Christmas Invasion is one of the best Christmas specials because it really is the episode that started it all. But there's loads to love about this episode. The silliness of Robot Santas and Christmas trees attacking people, the inspired design behind the Sycorax and their genius plan involving manipulating people's blood, Harriet Jones as Prime Minister, it's like a culmination of all the things that worked in Series 1 wrapped up into a nice neat little package and the episode manages to tread the line between campiness and seriousness that the best Doctor Who romps do so well. But really, all of this aside, the episode's most obvious success is the introduction of the now arguably most popular incarnation of the character ever, the Tenth Doctor. Just bear in mind the context of this. Whilst fans of the classic series were well aware of the concept of regeneration, the idea of abandoning your leading man so early in the game would have looked bizarre to younger viewers who weren't well versed in the show's history. But this episode pulls this off in fantastic fashion, which makes the concept of regeneration easy to understand without ever feeling patronising to fans who've been watching the show from day one. And this is because the episode wisely decides to focus upon the emotional fallout that such a change has on those in the Doctor's life. Rather than giving us an exposition dump which neatly explains away the concept, we have characters who are as confused about the Doctor's transformation as members of the audience are. Is that a different face or is he a different person? How should I know? The build up to the 10th Doctor revealing himself is also a perfect way to demonstrate how much Rose had grown since Series 1. Can you really imagine the Rose we saw running out of a shopping centre, scared for her life doing this? I address the Sycorax according to Article 15 of the Shadow Proclamation. All of this, of course, is just the prelude for when David Tennant finally emerges out of his post-regeneration slumber to take on the Sycorax and save the day. And in truth, 
he nails it. Using what limited time he has to showcase this Doctor's more fun-loving, whimsical side, in contrast to his more emotionally blunt predecessor. The story also sets in motion something that would come to define the Tenth Doctor's era, a looming, ever-present darkness underneath his warm, friendly exterior. Whilst this Doctor is someone who is happy to spend Christmas Day sat around the dinner table with Rose and her family, this is also the same man who refuses to give those who cross him second chances, or is willing to collapse someone's entire career because they violate his principles. I'm looking at you, Chris Chibnall. But in such a brief space of time, given how absent Tennant is from this episode, the Christmas Invasion shows us never-before-seen layers to the Doctor's personality and introduces us to an incarnation of the character who would go on to become the most popular Doctor in the show's history, with a confidence that the present iteration of the series could learn a thing or two from. Number 2. Voyage of the Damned Off the back of one of the best series cliffhangers, if only because it was so bad insane, Voyage of the Damned saw Doctor Who doing what it does best, blending genres together for a fun-filled action romp. This has the same thinking behind it as something like Last Christmas, but the execution is far better. This is basically the Poseidon adventure in space, and it plays with all the familiar tropes of a proper disaster movie, yet never loses that trademark Who charm. But, um, hold on, hold on, uh, what was your name? Like Key to the story's success is the time it takes to establish its supporting cast, with the highly memeable, vertically challenged cyborg Banakafalata being the absolute standout. Kylie Minogue was an inspired guest companion, and her pairing with David Tennant is just fantastic. We get to meet Wilf for the first time, and unlike some of the other specials on this list, the body count is suitably high for the threat the Doctor encounters. Across a tightly woven story, we come to know and like the survivors who join the Doctor and Astrid very well, and it's heartbreaking to see them perish. But it isn't like this romp of an episode doesn't have Russell T Davies' emotionally intelligent takeaways at its core. Sprinkle in an excellent guest spot by Russell Tovey, some deliciously intimidating robot angels, and an excellent ticking clock which keeps the pace moving throughout, and you have a Christmas special the whole family can enjoy. This episode also contains one of Tennant's best speeches, acting as one of the most triumphant declarations of intent of the Tenth Doctor's time. I'm 903 years old and I'm the man who's going to save your lives and all 6 billion people on the planet below. This speech hits especially hard when viewed in the context of Series 4 as a whole, as we watch the Doctor regurgitate a similar declaration in Midnight, only for it to be shot down by the supporting cast. Could you actually murder her? Any of you? Really? Or are you better than that? I'd do it. So would I. Any. Speaking of which, I'd highly recommend watching these two stories in a double bill. It showcases the Doctor with the best and worst of humanity. And finally, the greatest Christmas special of all time is... A Christmas Carol. Could it really have been anything else? A Christmas Carol cements Series 5's claim as the absolute peak of Doctor Who, with a victory lap which successfully marries the whimsy of the best Davies Christmas specials with a darker tone which would come to typify the Moffat era. Whilst Davies often chose to utilise Christmas as an excuse to amp up the theatrics, Moffat here opts for straight up pastiche, reinterpreting a Christmas carol through the lens of high concept science fiction with spectacular results. What makes this story such an unbridled success is Smith's role in this episode as a master of manipulation. Far from simply thinking on his feet and saving his friends through some sonic screwdriver based action, Smith opts to utilise his TARDIS in an almost ruthless fashion, irrevocably changing a man's life by travelling in time across Kazran Sardik's life to fundamentally alter who he is as a person. Whilst you can argue that the ends justify the means, the Doctor here is at his most alien, taking on the role of an almost quasi-god who doesn't think anything of completely altering someone's life as long as he gets the result he wants. This is a perfect way to seed in the arc that Smith would face in Series 6, where his meddling in time and space would see him vilified by races across the galaxy, and the sequence in which the Doctor shows a young Kazran exactly the sort of man he will become is the sort of wibbly-wobbly timey-wimey narrative pyrotechnics that only Stephen Moffat could properly pull off. With this kind of darkness running throughout the story, you would be forgiven for thinking that the episode gets bogged down in misery and forgets to have fun. But, as with the best Moffat episodes, A Christmas Carol is bursting with fun, ridiculous ideas, witty fast-paced dialogue, and breakneck pace, which makes the whole thing zip along with delight. I mean, sharks in space? 
This is absolutely bonkers, and I love it. This story is an excellent way to round off Series 5 in an episode which showcases exactly why Eleven will always be remembered as one of the best Doctor incarnations ever. We hope you enjoyed our festive countdown of the Doctor Who Christmas specials. If you disagree with anything we've said, please leave us a comment and let us know your own rankings. Have a Merry Christmas, and we'll see you in the new year. Stay with Thank you for watching another Full Fat video. If you'd like to see more from Full Fat videos, why not follow us on Instagram and Twitter? Please consider becoming a patron on Patreon. We've got some cool exclusive content on there. Thank you to our $100 patrons, Dr. Chike and Jax Merrick. Chris and I really, really appreciate it. Until next time, stay milky.